Welcome to Orthodontic Smiles, the podcast designed for all dentists and their staffs that practice orthodontics. Hi, I'm your host, Dr. Ed Gonzalez. The sponsor of our show today is the American Orthodontic Society. Today on Orthodontic Smiles, I'd like to welcome Dr. R. Bruce McFarlane. He's an orthodontist and maintains two private orthodontic practices in Winnipeg, Manitoba and Thunder Bay, Ontario, Canada, as well as he is a sought-after speaker, mentor for major orthodontic innovators such as Henry Schein Orthodontics, Align Technology, and Propel Orthodontics. He has written many articles in orthodontic journals and in textbooks. He is a frequent commentator on orthodontic educational websites and social media and well sought after all over the world. We'd like to welcome Dr. R. Bruce McFarlane. Orthodontic Smiles welcomes Dr. Bruce McFarlane. You've probably heard that name if you are doing any kind of orthodontics. Whether you're an orthodontist or a general practitioner, you've been introduced to uh, Henry Schein's uh, Carrier Symposiums, and Dr. Bruce McFarlane has been one of the stars of those uh, symposium for years now. Uh, obviously, he knows his stuff. I don't think uh, Henry Schein would put him up on a big podium like uh, they introduce uh, Carrier without uh, the knowledge of uh, what Dr. McFarlane can do. So I'm pleased to have met him uh, many years ago at uh, American Orthodontic Society meeting and what a nice guy and a very knowledgeable lecturer in all fields of orthodontics. So welcome Bruce. Thank you very much for uh, coming and, and being on our broadcast. Ed, it's such a pleasure. Thank you. What a kind introduction. Well, you deserve it. I mean, it's um, it's not too many people that get it to speak all over the world. I mean, literally all over the world uh, about the uh, carrier motion appliance, uh, and um, and you're very well respected. So I'm I'm pleased to have you on the broadcast. Uh, so we're going to get into this, and I I really want to know how did you get into you you obviously where did you go to school, and how did you get into orthodontics. Okay, wow. So, Ed, I've been a dentist since 1984, and uh, I came out of uh, dental school not not being fully uh, – have everything all figured out. So I actually practiced general dentistry for six years before I went back to graduate school to become an orthodontist. So uh, dental school at the University of Manitoba, and then I practiced up here in Canada for six years. And I think that was a really – very valuable years, actually. Uh, I I – feel like I had a pretty good background in general dentistry before I actually uh, went to grad school. Uh, I did orthodontics at the University of Western Ontario in London, Ontario, Canada. And now I have two practices, one in Winnipeg and one in Thunder Bay, Ontario. So, and as you mentioned, yes, I've been lucky to, uh, to get around a little bit. Uh, Carrier and Henry Schein have had me in uh, Istanbul, Baku, uh, and Dubai, and of course, all over the United States as well. So uh, I'm very fortunate. Yes, and I've attended your lectures, and they've been they've been awesome, uh, Bruce. So uh, let's get right into this thing here. Uh, you know, we, there's a lot of us that do orthodontics, and and um, and we all have found that uh, the carrier motion appliance has made some of the most difficult cases that we ever attempted much easier. And even in the mixed dentition, you know, tell me about uh, your experience. I'm a pediatric dentist, so uh, I'm always interested in what uh, you would have to say about treating out um, class twos and threes with the motion appliance in the mixed dentition. Well, Ed, I'll tell you, like I've uh, just like you, I've tried, <laughs> I've tried just about every. 
uh, single mouse trap that's out, that's out there, removable, fixed, and uh, it's uh, I've always come back to the carrier motion device, and I think because of its, you know, it looks like such a simple device, but there's so much going on with it, and it's so elegant, it's so well tolerated, it's relatively inexpensive compared to some of the other devices that are out there not easily broken and things going can't go wrong with it as easily as some of the other devices so uh, it's been my absolute go-to kind of like you uh for about the past 10 years or so in the mixed dentition yeah it, it works very well and it's it, you're right about that that it, it's easy um <laughs> i had my first carrier about uh well let's see my grandson is 21 so he was nine when I put it on, so that just gives you an idea how long ago I started putting these things on. <laughs> and and um, I, it's fun. It, it's fun now that he's twenty one. Uh, uh, you know, it's a whole different uh, grandson when you're when you got a twenty one year old going out uh, uh, to parties as uh, as we have. But <laughs> in, in any case, uh, he's got a beautiful set of teeth. He was a class two skeletal when we first started in. And I've told this story so many times, but uh, even to Carrier, when I interviewed him, I said, uh, he, why didn't you tell me we could use these things in skeletal class twos? And he says, I didn't know. He says, at the time that you started using them, um, I didn't know that the skeleton, that we could correct skeletal class twos with uh, the Carrier Motion Appliance. Back then it was the distalizer. Yes. And, um, and I put it on not even knowing myself that it would work, but he lived next door to me. So uh, if anything went wrong, I could always uh, uh, remove the appliance. So I, I gave it a try. And sure enough, within four months, Bruce, this uh, this thing had corrected uh, his uh, skeletal class two, and he looked fantastic. To this day, he looks awesome. His lower jaw came forward. He's, he's a perfect class one um, at the completion of treatment. And I think it only took me about uh, – um, something like maybe 12 months total treatment time, including the bracketing after the whole thing was after, after it was all done. So what's the yeah. advantages of this uh, carrier motion appliance in the mixed dentition? And, and, and we're talking mixed dentition. That's even more uh, applicable. I think it works better in the mixed dentition. <laughs> and that's an interesting comment. And I've had a great discussion with Luis Carrier about that very thing. Uh, it's been my thrust you know of course as an orthodontist i i get patients whenever i get them uh as a pediatric dentist or a general dentist i think you'll be in a much better driver's seat for this because you'll actually know these patients from a very young age and you can call it when the timing is is just right for these devices so uh i i think it's it's very applicable to uh the group that we're that we're talking to um the advantages are that it's uh it's it's very well tolerated it's it's effective. Uh, it's a terrific molar derotator, and of course that's important for initial class two correction to get that uh, mesial buccal cusp swung around in a lot of these mesial rotated molars. It's an excellent distalizer, which was you you mentioned its original name, and I think it's quite appropriate that they changed the name because there's so much more to it than just a distalizer. And then the the other two things that have been so kind of pleasantly surprising for me is such a neat uh, secondary reaction in the mandible. And you talked about it with your grandson, uh, with the mandible actually coming forward. And the overbite as well. And a lot of these kids are class two, but they're also very deep bites. And that has been really neat that we can address that early with the vertical vector of the elastics uh, working so well. Uh, the other neat things about them in the mixed are kids at this age will really help you out uh, and uh mom and dad yeah, like they're, them they're excited to get started with orthodontics when they're when they're, they're seven eight or nine right <laughs> exactly i mean i'm so assuming you're putting them on uh the the, the six-year molar and the primary cuspid are you using them that early yes absolutely right on yeah so that's a that's a wonderful time to be dealing with these kids they the you know, the growth event isn't quite as profound or quite as, as defined at that age, but we still get a really good uh, effect with uh, with the carrier motion, too, in the mixed dentition. 
Well, and let me ask you this question. One of the things that I've run into, and we're getting into a really, I love this kind of uh, podcast because we really get into the technical aspects of a of an appliance. And, and I think our listeners like to hear this. Uh, one of the things that I have found in a lot of the of, of, of my students when I teach is that they, they're kind of not ready to get started with full treatment comprehensive bracketing because all the primary teeth are have not been lost and the new permanent permanent ones have not come in yet so they have a tendency to not know exactly how to maintain the molar relationship that they've achieved with the carrier what i teach and i'm curious as to the way you do it i teach putting in a nance holding arch uh to the molar after I'm done. I mentioned this to Carrier. He had not done this. Uh, he thought it was it, it was uh, interesting. Uh, his concept was to overcorrect and uh, and leave it. But uh, I I never I never leave anything to chance. So I put in a Nance holding arch to hold the six year molars in place until all the rest of the primary teeth are lost and the permanent ones come in. Uh, Ed, no, I think that's a great idea. I'm more with carrier. We we actually overdo it, probably, you know, to kind of a super class one in the class twos. And then I'll hold just with a holly. If I'm, if I'm concerned, sometimes we'll use like a, a clear retainer on top and have them wear like some class two elastics at night. But my whole thing about early treatment is to really keep it short, sweet and defined and not use up too much of the kid's tolerance be, you know, we've we got to save some for phase two. Uh, oh, yeah. But, of course, a Nance doesn't require much in the way of uh, of maintenance or, or the child's participation. So I think that would qualify. Well, one of the things because that... Some that of, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. I didn't mean... To sorry. So some of the changes that have occurred can be uh, a bit tentative and a bit prone to relapse. So it's either overdo it or solidly hold it. Well, one of the things that we've been... Um, chastise for those of us who use uh, the carrier is that uh, this concept of uh, sagittal first uh, is not backed up by the the, the history of providing um, a mechanism for the lower arch to come forward if the upper arch hasn't been expanded and I'm curious if that's what you do is, unfortunately or unfortunately, that's what I do. I expand the upper arch, then use the carrier. Uh, the carrier uh, first, or the sagittal first concept does not suggest that. It suggests that afterwards. What do you do? <laughs> okay. So, Ed, uh, you, <laughs> you really run into a neat uh, concern of mine as well, uh, and that is there's this sagittal first concept is so dogmatic uh, that, you know, if you talk about transverse first, I'm actually quite a believer in that. And, uh, we, you know, of course, we talk the analogy of the of the foot coming forward. The shoe has to be wide enough. Absolutely. Uh, I think yeah. it's the same exact thing, Bruce, the, the tennis shoe and the high heel, right? Right. <laughs> right. Uh, a lot of my fellow speakers, though, they they – uh, are like you described, they get the sagittal first and then they'll deal with the transverse later. In my personal opinion, I think that's backwards. And I do a lot of these kids where uh, we're expanding first and I'm pretty old school with the, you know, the old Hyrax type uh, expanders or Haas type with the, with the screw. And then I've got a great maxilla into which the mandible just uh comes forward beautifully with and naturally with comes forward yeah carrier motion yeah we're, and, we're all uh, McNamara people aren't we uh, of we, course we, yeah yeah and we've sure. really uh, bought into that it's Indeed. it's hard to change those of us who grew up with that uh, uh, you know advance the the mandible by expanding the uh, the maxilla so I you know what let me one of the other things that is coming around that is so important and I'm becoming such an advocate of, and that's uh, pediatric sleep apnea mm -hmm. um, with uh, expanding the maxilla 
Um, this is something that's so important, and I think uh, those of us in pediatric dentistry and in orthodontics need to, to really more be more cognizant of this. Because if we ignore um, the maxilla and just do sagittal first, we've really not helped that child develop the maxilla to some degree so that if they have any sleep apneic uh, uh, diagnostic problems, um, we're really not helping them by expand, not expanding the maxilla. And I absolutely agree with that. And I think so. a lot more of it has come to light with the advent of 3D imaging. And uh, people like Sean Carlson and uh, Juan Carlos Quintero has showed us, you know, in amazing 3D, the kinds of changes that you can uh, realize with a, a, with a child's airway uh, through dealing with the transverse and the anteroposterior. So I, I'm actually in agreement with you. Absolutely. Quintero, I, I sat in his lecture. Um, I had been doing uh, probably over over 3,000 expansion cases, maxillary mandibular expansion cases. And I sat there, and he gave this lecture, and he was doing the exact same treatment I was doing, well, almost with the exact same appliances, but then he showed how, uh, with 3D, how the airway expanded, and I was amazed. I said, I didn't even know I was doing this. I <laughs> treated all these people, and I didn't even know that I was accomplishing what he was showing, so I was excited about it. And now um, it's become more and more evident that uh, we need to really uh, understand the airway and understand what sleep apnea is and how we literally can save lives by uh, by uh, just being cognizant of the airway. And I love that. You had no idea how brilliant you were. Yeah. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you for saying that. But I'm just uh, I'm, well I'm, I'm very um, emotional about it because I see so many kids that come into my office that have significant problems, uh, autism and Yes. And airway problems and, and problems in school, yes. uh, bedwetting, uh, grinding, all kinds of things that are directly related to the airway and, and how they can be helped by just uh, doing some maxillary expansion. So, you know, you, you've talked about the motion appliance uh, in the mixed dentition. And, and it, what disadvantages are there to using the motion appliance in the mixed dentition? Do you, you find anything that you don't like about it? Right. So, Ed, uh, you've, you've hit on one of them, and that is if you actually follow the ab absolute dogma of sagittal first, in my opinion, you're, you're missing out on an opportunity to, uh, to do some transverse work. So I, I think part of it, it isn't really a disadvantage, but if you actually follow the entire protocol, uh, I think you're, you're underwhelming the maxilla in the transverse. The other one that I see is there's a fairly narrow window of time that you can use this device in the mixed dentition because you have to have the six-year molar, but you also have to have a fairly decent-sized uh, deciduous canine to hook right. onto. So right. uh, sometimes I've got in fairly late because I haven't met the kid until that time. And we've had a few of them come in with their deciduous molar sort of swinging <laughs> off of their carrier motion device. Exactly. And we, we suggest that's a, our new way of exfoliating uh, baby teeth. But, uh, yeah. so it, it, it does pull them down, doesn't it? it right, it really you know, does. But, you know what I've done, uh, Bruce, is that I've, um, I've just waited a little bit longer, waited for the first primary molar to come out, yep. and let the first premolar erupt. And then I use the carrier off in, the short carrier from the first premolar to the molar, and I get the same results. Yep. That's an excellent solution, Ed. So if it's too late for the deciduous canine, uh, but you're getting a first premolar, go ahead and use that with a shorty. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Are you using the the colored uh, carriers? Uh, I haven't really uh, had those as a. As a you know, as something that I offer in my practice, we have a few of them, and it, certainly you know, if the kid looks in the at them and wants colors, we'll we'll go for it. But it hasn't really been a big deal. 
No, I think, yeah, it, it's it's not been a big deal for me either. I think most of these kids are excited to get some kind of braces and they want people to see them. So uh, they end right. up not giving us too much grief about using uh, a stainless steel appliance. Um, I, I've only in the past few years been using the Carrier Motion 3 appliance. Yes. Have you had a lot of experience with that? Yes, indeed, Ed. Oh, well, how, how are you using it in the mixed dentition? So uh, a lot of those, or almost all of them, they also have a transverse issue in the maxilla. So what I've been doing is using an expander, a fixed expander in the maxilla, and I've got like buckle tubes on the, on the sixes and some hooks, and then I'll, I will do the expansion. And while I'm holding with the expansion, we will put the carrier motion on from the lower C, deciduous canine, to the lower first molar. Mm-hmm. And then they run the elastics back to the band that, that's uh, attached to the expander. So it all kind of happens at once. Are, are you expanding at the same time you're using the, um, the rubber bands? Because I use rapid max or expansion, like it, we're, we're doing it in about two or three weeks. So I usually don't start the elastics until after I've kind of split the palate. And then we, we go ahead with, uh, with the class three elastics off the carrier motion. With all of these devices in the mixed ed, we stay with force one elastics. Mm-hmm. I find that force two is just too much of a load on a little baby tooth. Yeah. Well, and sometimes that's one the of the classrooms will even back up. A lot of the, I think a lot of the the the, uh, the the young guys that are just getting started with uh, the carrier really don't realize how important utilizing the right um, elastic uh, to the treatment. You can't use your your go to uh, class two elastic. You've got to use uh, the carrier uh, force one and force two. Yes, I agree. It's tried and, and true, so uh, definitely don't uh, don't go away from that. Yeah, um, are you uh, you're doing rapid palatal expansion to start with, and you're and you're starting out with um, the Force One on the Class Threes. Yes. Uh, so that means that you're doing. How quickly are you expanding within a matter of uh, you're, you're turning? How often? Once a day. Uh, and in a lot of them, I'm going twice a day. So, uh, we're actually expanding these kids in about two weeks. Most of them, depending on, of course, you know, how much expansion they need. And we like to overdo it a little bit. Uh, and then because I, I don't want any dental alveolar change. I'm all about physically splitting that palate. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so we have it happen very fast. And then while that's holding, we go ahead with the, uh, carrier motion elastics off of the lower C's. So you expand first and then start the elastic? Yes. Okay. All right. And and how long has this been taking you in most cases? Let's just say you have uh, anterior teeth and crossbite. Right. So, um, of course, that depends a little bit on how much of a class three they are. Like a lot of these kids are like the pseudo class three where they're actually edge to edge and then they posture forward. This thing very quickly overcomes that. Uh, but if they're, you know, if you're fighting a true uh, sort of, there's a skeletal component to the to the class three. I'm finding it about the same as the class twos, four to six months. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. I'm finding it just takes just a little bit longer to get those class threes. Yes. To move forward. The, you know, I'm I'm always amazed at the class twos how quickly they move, but the class threes seem to seem to take a bit a bit longer. You know, yeah. especially if they're skeletal and and uh, you've got some hereditary in, in, involved in it. Right. I agree. Uh, you know, one of the neatest things I do, I watch their profiles very carefully. And a lot of these kids, it's not that they are maxillary or mandibular prognathic. They are maxillary deficient in the anterior yes. posterior. And I exactly. think that might be the answer to your question, Ed, is it's a little tougher to haul a whole maxilla forward um uh and that's why maybe it's taking a little longer for the class threes i agree an yeah, extra few statistically months. you you're going to find most of the class threes are are maxillary deficient so yes. um, it, it, it you're right i agree but i mm-hmm. i've started these things at even in the primary dentition and gotten some great results in the primary dentition 
As in not even a, a, a first molar? Yeah. Is that exactly. right? Exactly. <laughs> That's and cool. They, and they've t- treated out just like I would put on a uh, reverse pull headgear. I can um, I, I can reverse uh, the anterior cross bite the same way. Uh, Carrier awesome. suggested that uh, when I spoke to him is that he he uses uh, in the primary dentition in a rapid power expansion, but he, he'll just get started even earlier getting that cross bite corrected. Wow. What disadvantages do you find on the motion three? Well, um, a few of them, and I you know I think if there's a true skeletal class three coming <laughs> you're not going to overcome it and i always you know we always look around the family and see uh um you know what the what the skeletal tendency is in the family uh the it's a little harder on a lower uh deciduous canine as in we get a fair bit more over eruption of the lower deciduous canine than we do an upper deciduous canine in the class twos so we end up having to do a little bit of a occlusal collaboration once we get the the bite jumped. Yeah, uh, they do. They do kind of come up out of the socket, don't they? Right, indeed. And yeah. it scares it scares people. I get calls all the time from some of my students, and they say that these uh, th- these appliances are pulling the the cuspid out of the socket. And I said, just bear with it; it'll be yeah. okay. Indeed, uh, and even permanent cuspids later on as well, Ed, and we yeah. see that. I've seen uh, that too. A few solutions for that is if I see too much of that, I will switch to a shorty and come off the lower first premolar. Uh-huh. Uh, the other thing we've been doing fairly recently is actually physically cementing the canine to the first premolar in those cases. Like underneath the carrier motion, those two teeth are actually bonded to each other. And I find there's a little more resistance to the extrusion because you're... Wow, what a great idea that is. That is awesome. I, I hadn't even thought of that. And, 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 and that's one of the things I've always been concerned about. But I was under the impression that the that when you were using the, the cuspid and it kind of over erupted, that that's what drove the lower incisors when you finally put the brackets on and you leveled in a line that the lower incisors came up and got uh, into a, a much better uh, interincisal position. Yes. And, you know, so that I've never really been one to not allow the cuspid to come up. But now that you say that, that might be a, th- a thing to consider because I, I have seen the cuspids kind of seem to come up quite a bit in some cases. Yeah, it can be a little frightening. <laughs> it can be uh, a little frightening. It's yeah. scary. I, I'm always worried about the the gingival and um, uh, position of the when the cuspid comes up that high. I'm I'm worried right. about the 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 final outcome of any uh, gum tissue uh, result as a result of that. Indeed, I in general, and I find that it reverses itself quite nicely in most cases. I have never well, really does, sort yeah. of you know. Iatrogenically produced a dehiscence or something like that, uh, especially since almost immediately after that we're getting into something on the lower arch, either aligners or uh, or braces, and so I find it's a rather temporary thing. Yeah, well, let's get into that for just a minute. I mean, you orthodontists have kind of taken over with this align um, of products uh, that uh, have have come out and and it's amazing to me I've, i'm familiar with several very good family and friends that um or who are orthodontists who almost exclusively use um aligners in their practice rather than uh, brackets anymore and i'm there actually one of my offices i have two in canada one is is clear aligner exclusive uh and i've, I've sort of that has by declaring that, you pretty well force yourself to look at every single case as a clear aligner case. And uh, but I, it's nice to have, be, you know. Ha- having said that, I'll still use a lot of uh, auxiliaries, and of course, carry motion both class two and class three dovetail so nicely with clear aligners. Uh, in the class twos, we start the lower arch already, and get it leveling and aligning as the carrier motion is doing its thing. And then by the time we're in a class one platform, the lower arch is pretty well done. And then we just rescan them. We rescan them actually with the carrier motion still on 
and have the text virtually remove them. And then we finish with uh, full upper and lower clear aligners. So it's pretty slick and very uh, time efficient as well. Oh, my goodness, yes. Um, I, have you had any introduction to the Henry Schein uh, aligner system? Okay, it, it's not available in Canada just yet. But I have sat in on some of the early uh, lectures, and uh, it's it's interesting. It's quite a bit clearer than uh, Invisalign aligners, and uh, they they don't use uh, attachments. Not as many attachments. If I could eliminate attachments, that would be, that'd be awesome. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's uh, you know I find some patients are, or have as many as ten or twelve attachments, uh, and uh, you end up half half the time uh, just spending a, a good portion of time just grinding these things off when you're done. Yep. It's not that the cases turn out badly. It's just that that that's one of the problems. So if uh, if Henry Schein has solved that problem, that's going to be uh, um, an, a very interesting, um, you know, special thing for their or their product. Now, do you think these, uh, these uh, the carrier and, and the aligners are, are saving patients uh, trouble and expense? Okay, I think that's a really important thing for us to explore, Ed. And in, in general, uh, you have to justify that. You have to, the answer has to be yes to that in order to justify early treatment. There's a lot of kids who come in and we say, gosh, you know, this, this kid's going to be a braces kid later on. So we're, let's just, you know, throw him back or replant him in our garden. Uh, a lot of it, the demand though comes from mom and dad. Like they go, gosh, you know, this kid's teeth are way out there. I know he's still got a lot of baby teeth. Is there something we can do in the meantime? And uh, those ones we really listen carefully to. Sometimes there's psychosocial concerns for these kids, especially the class threes. The class three can't hide his malocclusion. Uh, a, a class two kid will walk around all day with their mandible postured forward and because they subconsciously are aware of it. So I think it's important that we're able to look at parents and say, yes, there are things that we can do in the mixed dentition that will be absolutely beneficial to your child and will save us trouble and expense in the second phase. And in a lot of cases, we can do things in, in the mixed dentition that if we don't do them, in my opinion, uh, we have missed an opportunity. Oh, absolutely. Makes your life so much easier. Um, you know, when I start my lectures with my students, I, I say, what kind of case would you like to start a comprehensive case with? Would you class like one case? platform. Yeah, class <laughs> one platform, yes. nice, uh, broad arch, um, no crowding, uh, all of the beautiful things that you would love to see a case come in with, and that's what you can provide them with early treatment orthodontics and and correcting the the one thing that we weren't able to do for years when we were using back years and years ago when we were using headgears, and I think they're still being taught in a lot of orthodontic schools, um, it, it is that class two positioning of the molar. And, if we can get everything else done and get the molar corrected as well, oh my gosh, the cases treat out in a matter of months. Yep. I mean, literally six to eight months sometimes. I'm getting done with cases much, much quicker than I have ever gotten done with them before. Absolutely agree, Ed. It's been a real neat uh, addition to my repertoire. The other cool thing, of course, is that the both it, the upper incisors in the class twos and the lower incisors in the class threes, although we're not hooking directly onto those teeth, we see such a nice opening up of those teeth. And, and especially when it comes to clear aligners, if we're going to follow that up with a class two clear aligner case uh, that had really crowded upper incisors, those aligners can grab a lateral incisor so much better if it's isolated because of the interceptal fibers that have have uh, pulled it apart with the carry motion. Yeah. Yeah. It's magic. And we, we've always struggled so much with lateral incisors with clear aligners. So I just love using carry motion first. Yeah, you get that little space between the lateral and the cuspid as yes. you distalize. Uh, it's it. much easier to move that lateral, isn't it? And, ro and rotate it, bring it forward, do what you need to do with it. 
It's perfect. It's it's amazing. Right. Well, the, the, you know, these things are being used by general dentists, and I know you're out there teaching, and, and a lot of general dentists have heard you speak about uh, incorporating these strategies into their practices. Uh, I, I, what's the best way to do that for them? I mean, there's there's a lot of guys out there using the carrier appliance and Align products. Uh, how would you suggest that they get the knowledge? Well, thank you, Ed. Uh, I actually have a little uh, company that I help out uh, general dentists, and I can be the the angel on your shoulder, especially when you're first starting tr- some of these things, if you have some trepidation. I talk about the definition of an expert is someone who has made pretty well every mistake possible. So that's me. <laughs> that's me too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so, Ed, the, uh, it's a little company called I Can Do, which is an acronym for Improvement Constant and Never Ending for Dentists in Orthodontics. And it's it's a website. It's icando.ca. That, uh, it's a Canadian website, so make sure it's .ca. And uh, on there is all of my online courses and uh, all of lectures that have been recorded that I've done. And also, I think one of the most valuable things is there's a mentoring service. So on a case-by-case basis, you can send me all of your records and your sort of treatment goals. And especially when you're first getting into this, I will uh, sort of give you the the step-by-step on how to get this set up and how to oppose the carrier motion on the other arch. Uh, And I think one of the most valuable things is along the way, I will troubleshoot for you. So, you know, something's going wrong or you're worried. It's just a a photo and uh, I will absolutely. What a great idea, Bruce. That's uh, that, that you, you understand that there are people that are not really getting in trouble. They just think they are. Sure. <laughs> Sometimes you just hold their hand just a little bit and they That's can it, get yeah. through just about anything and find out that they are rock stars doing um, orthodontics. So that's a great idea to have come up with that concept. And I'm sure that will be very valuable. And I hope that uh, there'll be a lot of people out there that heard this uh, podcast and will refer to uh, you as uh, their mentor. That's great. You know, we've got um, well over 5,000 people listening to this uh podcast in 57 countries so um i'm sure you'll get some phone calls for sure awesome all right bruce i can't thank you enough you 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 put together a great podcast for us and um something that uh, a lot of people are interested in i i'm um i'm very impressed with the fact that not only you're using it in the mixed dentition uh as there's quite a few people that don't do that but i'm impressed that you do Number one, I'm impressed that you still stick by the old McNamara theory of uh, expanding the maxilla first. That's uh, th- that's incredible. That goes against the grain, and but I still think it's the right thing to do. And uh, you've outlined uh, the advantages and disadvantages of the of the motion two and motion three. Um, what a great podcast this was, and I thank you so much for being on. Ed, it's such a pleasure. Well, thank you so much. And um, I hope you uh, tune in to Orthodontic Smiles in the future and listen to some other really, really good speakers that come on and tell us their experience about uh, doing orthodontics in their practice. So thank you so much, and thanks for being on Orthodontic Smiles podcast. You're very welcome. This is your host, Dr. Ed Gonzalez. I want to thank you for listening to Orthodontic Smiles today. If you enjoyed our broadcast, uh, please uh, click the subscribe button. We'll be in touch with you in the future about our further broadcasts. Thanks for listening.